Oh, here we go. Video number three. All right, as promised, I'm back. I apologize, the last video ended quite abruptly, but we had finished uh, down to the last few words of a sentence. So, <clears throat> so it's all good. So we're back. I want to continue on in the world of infectious disease. And now I actually want to walk through different infectious diseases. I want you to be familiar with the terms uh, and sort of this world of infectious disease because how remarkably important it is to us. All right, so in the world of pathogens, they break them down into these sort of five simple categories. Something called prion diseases, and then viruses we've all heard of, bacterial infections we've all heard of. Then there's fungal and yeast infections called mycotic infections, and then finally these things called helminths or parasitic worms. All of these are single cell organisms with the exception of the helminths, and that's gonna be multi, multiple. All right, so the very first thing is a prion. What is a prion, prion disease? You may have heard of this before as mad cow disease. That's one of the prion diseases. So prion stands for a proteinaceous infectious particle. I um, mean, it's, it's all it is, it's a protein. It's not a cell, it doesn't have a cell wall, it doesn't have a genetic material. It is a misfolded protein. It's a protein that's folded in a funny way. And we're not even sure how we get it in our system, but we think it may come in orally through food, that we've eaten something that, that had this misfolded protein in it. Uh, and then it works its way through our vascular, cardiovascular, you know, intestinal system, into our cardiovascular system, and eventually up in the brain. Um, and the reason we think that is that there used to be a disease called Kuru, and it was associated with cannibals. And it was actually these particular group of people, when someone died, the way you kind of bear it and get rid of them is they cooked them and ate them. And the people who ate their, their brain where the infection was, they themselves will go on to get it. So it appears by eating the brain with the misfolded protein in it, you got the same thing. So, so it seems. All right, and once these misfolded proteins get into your system, in your brain, they can actually start to cause the proteins around them to become misfolded. So what happens is when they become misfolded, the body now recognizes them as foreign. So the body attacks them and destroys them. In the process of destroying that protein, it then destroys the area around the protein as well, and it literally makes a hole in the brain. So the brain slowly turns into the sponge, and these are why they're called spongiform diseases, and because it's in the brain, it's encephalitis. So all these disorders are called a spongiform encephalitis. And then in the world of humans, there's the th three. They're all quite rare. There's Craigfeld, Jacobs disease, and the gertz monstratos or <laughs> Schlenker syndrome, and then familial, fatal familial yeah, insomnia. The problem is, with all these disorders, they're very, very hard to diagnose. They are, there is no treatment, and they are progressive and lethal. We sort of sought this out, you know, after the fact. Now the person passed away and you do an autopsy and you figure out they died of a prion disease. Very rare, but that's one of the forms of infectious disease. Um, viruses. Now we come into the world of really common infectious disease. Most infectious diseases we see are viruses. Uh, we know that when I see children with ear infections, that 90% of those ear infections are viral. When we see people with sinus infections, 80% of those sinus infections are, are viral. So viruses are a very common form of infectious disease. Viruses, though, the thing you have to know is they're single cell microbes and they're, they're much smaller than bacteria. I mean, a bacteria would be the size of this house and the virus would be the small of a little bird <laughs> trying to get into it. So viruses are teeny tiny. You cannot see a virus on a regular light microscope. You have to use electron microscopes to be able to see a virus. And the only thing a virus consists of is a, a shell, a proteinaceous shell called a capsid, and inside the capsid is the genetic material, which can be RNA or DNA. Most of the time it's RNA. So, and, and, and so viruses, you be, there's no organelles in them. There's nothing in there. They don't eat, they don't excrete. There's nothing else inside here. It, it, in fact, it's, you could almost say they're not alive because they can't reproduce on their own. So what they do is they have to use another cell to reproduce. As a result, they have to get inside another cell, so it's intracellular, they have to, it's obligate, and they're parasites. So all viruses are intracellular obligate parasites. And what they do is, Viruses are referred to as being very tissue specific. When a, when a virus attacks a cell, it only attacks one type of cells. So if a person gets rabies, for example, it only attacks nerve cells. If a person gets chicken pox, it attacks the skin. If you get a common cold, it has a tendency to attack the cells that make up your, your, your sinuses and your lungs. In the case of coronavirus, the same thing. It attacks the respiratory epithelium, the cells that line our airways and our lungs. Um, and that's where it causes all the problems. So viruses are very tissue, very, very tissue specific. So what do they do? 
when a virus <clears throat> gets into the body, it then finds its specific cell. So like in the case of your sinuses and your airways, these things called respiratory epithelial cells. It then lands on it, attaches itself to the cell. It then has a mechanism for inserting or injecting its RNA into that cell. And once it's in there, it goes down to the cell's RNA or DNA, and it turns the cell into a virus factory. So now the cell, instead of doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, it's now, it's now replicating the virus genetic material and making capsids and combining the two. And the cell slowly fills up until finally the cell literally ruptures, releasing out the virus so it can now infect more of the tissues surrounding it and it can also be released out of the environment. The symptoms come with that tissue destruction. That's when you know you have a virus. Because once the virus is on the body inside the cell, it's out of sight, out of mind. The immune system can't find it temporarily. It's until it ruptures and released out of the environment that now the immune system can, can find it and go after it. All right, so viruses are very tissue specific. They enter the body um, and they attach to very specific cells. Inject the genetic material in, you know, and then the cell slowly fills up with viruses and, and ruptures. All right. It is the way I mentioned, it's the rupturing of the cells that causes the symptoms, the fevers, the sore throat, the coughs, etc. Exa examples of viruses I'm sure you've heard of. Varicella, which is chicken pox. Rhinovirus and adenoviruses cause common colds. Herpes simplex is a virus that causes cold sores. HIV, human deficiency virus, is what causes AIDS. Influenza virus, hepatitis A, or influenza A, influenza B, coronavirus that we've seen this year. Uh, hepatitis A, B, and C, viruses that affect the liver. Rabies we, we kind of talked about. All right, so those are viruses. Now we come up to bacteria. Bacteria are huge compared to viruses. They're much bigger and you can see bacteria under just a regular light microscope. They are also single cell organisms, but these guys can replicate on their own. They are alive and they replicate by binary fission. So one becomes two, two become four. Um, <clears throat> but they also contain organelles. They may or may not have a nucleus. That depends whether what's called a prokaryote or eukaryote. But at any rate, the genetic material is in there, as well as organelles, possibly mitochondria, Golgi, Golgi apparatus. So these guys are alive. They are consuming, they're eating, they're excreting, and they're multiplying. Uh, and, 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 a, and a bacteria is defined by, first and foremost, their shape, the form. So some are called rods and spheres, coils, um, um, spirals, like spirochetes, like Lyme disease. Uh, they're also defined by the use of oxygen. There's aerobes and anaerobes. Aerobes use oxygen, anaerobes don't like oxygen. And also by the color. They don't have any color on their own, so how we stain them. We use something called a gram stain. We stain bacteria, some are gram, what we call gram stain positive. They turn blue from the stain, and some turn red, and that's called gram stain negative. But, but the most important thing is that, um, they can replicate really rapidly in ideal conditions. So next slide, just a little f f example of that whole thing. Ideal condition inside the human body at 98.6 degrees, 37 degrees Fahrenheit, where it's nice and warm and moist and lots and lots and lots for these guys to eat, um, they can reproduce every 27 minutes. Well, let's round it up to every half hour, 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, these guys can reproduce. So if you look at it and you start to follow the numbers, you know, you start with one half hour, they got two, a half hour, they got four. So the first hour, they got four. Then we go to 48 to 16. By the time we get four hours out, we're now at 256. By the time you get down to 24 hours later, you have 256 trillion of these guys doubling every half hour. That's why bacterial infections are highly dangerous and can be highly lethal and rapidly because their ability to multiply really, really quickly. And one of the things the human body does is when it recognizes the waste products being produced by the bacteria and the damage you know, that's being done by the bacteria, the human body, the body create, generates a fever. And when you jack the temperature up, when the fever gets up above around 102 degrees or so, the bacteria stop multiplying. That's why the body generates a fever to protect itself against it. So now our white blood cells can battle you know, these bacteria, not have to battle all the progeny at the same time. All right, so some examples. Rickettsia, 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 Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Chlamydia, the most common sexually transmitted disease in the world. Spirochetes like Lyme disease and syphilis. Um, enteric bacteria, gram-negative aerobes, you know, mycobacteria, tuberculosis, and then these gram-positive stuff. These are all different types of bacteria. Strep throat is a, bac is a bacterial infection. Certain types of pneumonia are bacterial infections. Certain types of meningitis can be either bacterial or viral. So from bacteria, we then go to these things, the mycotic infections, um, which are yeast and fungi. And these are also single cellular organisms, but what happens is yeast and fungi, when they multiply, they form these little chains. As they multiply, they stick together. So they form these branching chains. Uh, um, 
And, and you've heard of them. They think they cause things like yeast, vaginitis, athlete's foot, ringworm, which is not a worm, it's a fungal infection. Think about myconic infections, they're a nuisance. Very rarely are they lethal, as long as your immune system is intact, you're gonna be fine. But, you know, but most of the time, they're just a simple nuisance and they're easily treated. The next thing we come to are protozoal infections. Also in the world of bacteria, also single cell organisms. The thing about protozoa though is they're mobile. They have flagella, they got wavy surfaces on their membranes, they can squirt out uh, uh, pseudo feet like amoebas to crawl around. So protozoa are mobile, they can, they can move around, they can get around the environment. When a person gets a protozoal infection, such as giardia or amoebiasis, there's a delay because it has to multiply within the system. And the delay can be days to weeks. And, and the vast majority of our protozoal infections are more sort of intestinal diarrhea type, type of injuries. But there are some that are absolutely lethal. And then the last family of these things called helminths. These are multicellular worms and stuff. They usually are in the GI tract. And there's a long delay of onset of symptoms because the person has to consume it, has to get it in their food, which is the way you get it most of the time, although you can even get them through your feet. You know, and later on in the course, we're going to do a whole section on this stuff called tropical medicine. Uh, um, you know, but there's a delay because they have to get in your system multiplied. And that delay is typically months to even up to years. And there's a couple of varieties. There's something called uh, flatworms, these platyhelminths, which consist of trematodes or flukes and cestodes, which are tapeworms. And then the roundworms, which are, are they're called nematodes. Things like ascariasis, pinworm, whipworm, whipworm and on Onchocercus volalis, which is the most common time of blindness in the world. Don't expect you to remember all this now. We're gonna come back to this later, but I just kinda of wanna show you these different families and how they exist. So now, what does our immune system do? Gotta take just a few minutes on this. The human immune system, the whole point of your immune system is to recognize self from non-self. So it doesn't belong in me or doesn't belong in me. And we've got white blood cells that, that all the time are crawling around through our system, sliding in out between all of our cells, making sure that it's, it belongs to us, that it's part of us. If it's not part of us, the, the immune system's gonna destroy it. So our first line of defense is our skin. As I mentioned earlier, our skin is bug proof. There are very, very few things that can actually penetrate our skin, that can work its way through our skin. So our skin is virus and bacteria, it's pretty much bug proof, if it's intact. If there's a wound that's open or an abrasion or, or a blister or sunburn, something like that, well then the system's open and things can get through it. But intact skin is bug proof. So that's our first layer of defense. Um, and uh, then the second layer of defense um, is our actual immune system itself, when things get in the, into the body. And you've, you've heard the term white blood cells. So white blood cells are our defense mechanism against infectious disease. And the white blood cells are gonna destroy microbes. Uh, they're gonna destroy foreign proteins that don't belong there. They're gonna form cancer, they destroy cancer cells that form in the body. And, and then in the process, the white blood cells also cause or create something, produce something called antibodies. And we're gonna talk about those in more detail later on as well too. But the whole idea of an antibody is it, it's, when it's produced, it now protects you from the infection in the future. So you hear a lot about right now about people getting tested for coronavirus and the antibodies. Right now we test most people with coronavirus, we're actually just testing for the virus itself to see if they have the virus, that's what makes them sick. Later we can come back and we can actually test them for antibody production. And if they have the antibody in their system, then they can't get the same infection again. Uh, you know, if you get certain types of cold, you get an adenovirus, or you get influenza, your influenza B, if you get it, you develop the antibodies against it and you can't get the same one again. You have to get a different illness next time. So that's what antibodies, you'll hear the different names of antibodies, IgM, IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgD. Uh, and then there's finally the lymphatic system. Now, this is a system that parallels our cardiovascular system. The whole point is that, is that our body is, is, there's fluid in the body all the time that has to be recovered and returned to the cardiovascular system. These fluids come back up through the lymphatic system. And again, we're gonna go through this in more detail later. But within your lymphatic system, the fluid's called lymph. Um, and as this fluid travels along, as it comes to all your joints, there are little lymph nodes that the fluid travels through that contain white blood cells that are looking for foreign proteins, you know, viruses, bacteria, et cetera, and they'll kill them and destroy them. So it protects us. So our lymphatic system protects us from infection as well. All right, last thing, vaccines. And what are, what are vaccines all about? So the purpose of a vaccine is to expose our immune system to a killed pathogen. So you take... Um, some sort of infectious disease, mumps, measles, rubella, influenza, influenza B. And what you want to do is you want to, you want to destroy it, you want to kill it, but you want the outside, you want the cell wall, you want the capsid that has the proteins attached to it, because that's what the body's looking for and it's going to find. So if I, can, if I can give this person the dead vaccine, the dead virus ahead of time, 
the body make antibodies against it. So now, if they get exposed to the virus, then the antibodies are already there to kill it. They don't have to go through any other system. There's just a direct lethal you know, <laughs> assault on that virus. A good example is the rabies virus. If people are working around with animals and there's a chance to be, could be exposed to rabies, then we give them the rabies vaccine ahead of time. That way, if they are exposed to it, the antibodies are already there. If someone is bitten by an animal and are concerned about the animal having rabies, then we give them the antibodies. You know, so the antibodies are in the system so they can't get rabies. Uh, um, so it's a way of your immune system to develop the antibodies to protect us from the infection ahead of time. And it's very effective. It's so effective that in the past, um, there was a disease called smallpox. Highly contagious, one of the most contagious inf infectious diseases ever known to mankind. And one out of three people who got it died from it. So it was extremely lethal as well. Well, through the vaccine process, we were able to eliminate smallpox on the planet Earth. It took about 20 years. But by 1972, the last case of smallpox was seen and known and seen since. We've all, we're also working on getting rid of polio. We've got polio pinned down to just a couple small parts of the world. We're going to get rid of that disease. And we've also gotten rid of dr uh, dracunculus already as well, too. So through the vaccine process, we are we were able to eliminate some very significant diseases. Um, common childhood vaccines, <laughs> that any of you had your childhood vaccines, you had MMR, mumps, mus, and rubella. You've had your tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hemophilus influenza, chickenpox, which also is varicella, human papillovirus, which, which can cause cervical cancer, uh, meningitis, meningococcal vaccines, poliovirus, rotavirus, influenza viruses. These are all vaccines we give kids so as they grow up, they have immunity. So they, they, they will not have to get these diseases. People travel around the world to get some extra vaccines. Yellow fever, yellow fever is a virus. Uh, um, and it, it is a virus that attacks your vasculature, your blood vessels and destroys them, you bleed to death internally. And it is lethal. So if people are going to parts of the world with this yellow fever, we like to give them the yellow fever vaccine. The vaccine is so effective that one vaccine is good for life and you're all set for life. Do the same thing with typhoid and polio and hepatitis A and B, rabies, cholera potentially, and also all travelers could give them anti-malarial you know, prophylaxis so, that they, so to help them avoid getting malaria. So that's a little bit on vaccines. I know there's a lot of information, but again, we wanna get the process started and we're gonna come back to it as well. So last, last sort of thing here. So prion diseases, you know, you won't know until it's, it's too late. We don't know a great deal about them, but it is an infectious disease. Viral illnesses. Remember, viruses are very, very tissue specific. They, they cause low grade fevers, kind of generalized aches and pains, general malaise, just don't kind of feel very well. Bacterial infections, rapid onset. This is the guy that can really take off fast and every 20, you know, over a period of 24 hours can, can get very severe. So, so there's a rapid onset of bacterial infections. They can develop a high fever fatigue and then rapidly deteriorate any conditions. The mycotic stuff we mentioned, mostly the skin, mostly a nuisance, easily treated and managed. Protozoal infections are mostly GI, although there are other protozoal infections that can cause problems. Symptoms quite often are associated with diarrhea, you know, gas, abdominal cramping, uh, while we sort out what's going on. And then finally, the helminthic infections. And, you know, these are mostly worms that people see in their stools. And these come on months to years later after the exposure. All right, so that pretty much com completes the, the world of infectious disease. So we start out by talking about uh, um, <clears throat> exposure, the diseases, the body substance isolation. Then we wanted to walk through these different names. So as you read articles in the future, you hear other lectures, you hear things, you're going to know what, they're, what these terms mean and what they're talking about. All right, so that should wrap things up for us from infectious disease. The next thing we're going to do is, is uh, one more relatively boring lecture before we start getting to substance things. And that's going to be about medical legal issues. You know, so we're going to have to you know, go over that as well, too. All right, so thanks a million. Appreciate your time, and we'll see you on the next video. Thank you. 